Hello and welcome everyone to the Movement Made Better podcast. Today's guest, Perry Nicholson. Perry, thank you very much for coming on. We are super excited to have you today. Go ahead and give the listeners a little background on yourself, please. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you, gentlemen, for having me on. And I love the name of your podcast. You know, I'm all about movement. And that's how we kind of hooked up in the first place, right? Uh, yeah. In the movement world. And I got to say, before I start talking about my stuff, how much I love the stick mobility. You you were kind enough to give me some of them. I think I have like early models. Oh, you uh, still, yeah, you you still got the first gen. The, yes. That did, man. You yes, know, you got you first gen. The, the kung fu grip things on the end that you changed up. <laughs> but dude, I tell you, I love those things. And honestly, they were very instrumental in helping me recover from my quad tendon tear because of doing the, the isometrics in those mm-hmm. movements really helped me recover. So I just want to say thank you. I love all the work that you're doing. It was very helpful for me personally. Well, thank you, um, thank you very much. Thank you for that. Yeah. Man. We appreciate that. So yeah, a, a little bit about me. Well, um, let's see. I'm, I'm the owner of Stop Chasing Pain, which is my business. It's trying to help people all over the world to try to heal and recover from all types of pain, from chronic pain, physical pain, emotional pain. And the whole premise is to not just treat where they hurt, but look everywhere else as well. <laughs> That's kind of my motto. My my degree was in chiropractic, I think, 23 years ago, which is, I can't believe I have to say 23 years <laughs> now. But, you know, it's crazy because people, I don't even tell people I'm a chiropractor anymore because when I say that, they automatically think that of what I do, mm-hmm. right? Like I, yeah. like, I just take care of backs or back pain, and I don't really do too much of that anymore. I honestly can't even describe what I do. It's almost <laughs> like this hybrid mix of anything and everything that I need to do that I've studied over the years to try to help people. I think the biggest thing that I try to do is to take complex things and make them very simple and basic and fundamental and applicable to help people heal. That's one of the reasons why I think movement works so great because it can do so many wonderful things and it's not that complicated and how you can do some amazing things with a single stick. I mean, right. I mean, it's just Mm -hmm. this, fundamentals and basics. And that's what got me into what we're going to talk about today with the lymphatic system as a fundamental and a basic, uh, just that most people have no idea that it exists. That's all. (laughs) And and then when you do, you usually say, why in the hell didn't somebody tell me this a long time ago? (laughs) Very true. Yes. That pretty much brought me to where I am right now. You know? So like you alluded to today's subject matter is the lymphatic system. We know a lot of listeners right now are like the lymphatic what? And so they don't have any concept of what it is. So let's introduce them to that, please. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And, you know, honestly, I had the same reaction. Oh, did you? <laughs> five, five, I did. Well, five years ago, because it's probably a, a context to give you my story. You know, I've been in healthcare for 23 years and I've been studying a lot of different disciplines from, you know, musculoskeletal system and the nervous system and pain science and all these different things that you can do to help people become healthy and heal. And I was doing that. In the background, something was slowly happening to me where my body was actually falling apart. I came down with an autoimmune disease, which means that I got sick and nobody really knows what it was or why it happened. And the traditional, everything that I knew was not really helping. I mean, it it may have been preventing me from getting worse, but it certainly wasn't helping me recover the way I wanted to. And the traditional approaches from medicine when they were trying to help me were making me way worse, slowly killing me. They weren't doing it on purpose. It's just their the way that they do things. Mm -hmm. And I, I knew that I had to look for answers that were not there. I was missing something that I was not seeing. And and in all honesty, I think I've been looking for this my whole life because one of the things that's always been in the back of my mind is not so much why people get sick because that's part of being alive, right? But you're not supposed to stay sick. Mm -hmm. You're not supposed to be injured all the time. You're not supposed to be tired, fatigued, lethargic, and have all these disease names that we just become used to hearing and we think it's normal. It's not normal. The the human body is designed to recover and adapt and be be resilient. And just because you get older in your quote unquote years doesn't mean your body has to decay. And then you get this BS stuff where they say you're just getting older, which infuriates me. (laughs) 
because I'm, I just turned 54 and I feel better and move better than I did when I was 24 without question. Yeah. You just have to know how to do it. So I was really bad guys. I had to stop teaching. I had to stop traveling. I had to stop uh, seeing clients. I closed my office. I could, I'm not even sure if you knew this. I, no, I no. could barely function. I could barely function. I was taking four or five naps a day. My memory was going, I had brain fog. I was actually headlong into a neurodegenerative disorders with Alzheimer's type symptoms where I could barely remember things that happened minutes before. And I was into, I had a nervous breakdown and a physical breakdown. I was bad. It was that suffering that led me to search for answers and seek things that I never would have looked for before because I was not suffering, right? I mean, when you're comfortable, why do you want to change? <laughs> yeah, yeah. A, It was a big lesson for me that, you know, the universe saw it that, hey, Harry, I'm going to kick your ass because I need you to learn something here to, to try to change the world. That's kind of the way I look at it. And I, I came across the lymphatic system and by, uh, I went to a workshop in London to start to study energy medicine from a standpoint of what do cells need in order to heal, recover, and regenerate from an energy standpoint. At that workshop, somebody said, I think I know what your problem might be. And I'm like, well, can you tell me? Because I'd love to know. <laughs> and I said, I think your lymphatic system is this, an issue. And I said exactly what you said. That's what? <laughs> uh, because i never really thought about it i mean the lymphatic system is we'll get more into about what it is in a moment but it, it's a system that not many people hear about unless you have two things if you have cancer then you hear about lymph because cancer can spread throughout the human body via the lymphatic system it's called a metastasis and the other one is when you have what's called lymphedema. That's where you have a body part that might swell up with fluid or inflammation to sometimes four or five times the original size. Then they know oh, lymphedema. But I never even thought about it. And this person uh, proceeded to do a lymph assessment on me. And they, they press their fingers in areas of the body where you have what they call lymph nodes. Lymph nodes are gatherings of the lymphatic system that are designed to protect you and heal you. The, the basic function of the lymphatic system is to kill stuff, like bad things. It's part of your immune system, and it's also part of your cardiovascular system, which many people are really blown away by. But its job is to kill bacteria, viruses, all different types of viruses, parasites, fungus, cancer, metabolic waste, and cellular waste. That means that's the waste of your own cells that die naturally from you just being alive every day because you have like literally billions of cells always dying and then you make new ones. Mm -hmm. But those old ones, they need to get out. If they stay in you, that's not good. That's toxicity. Yeah. The lymphatic system, that's its primary job, right? Is to keep bad stuff from killing you. And when it gets in, it has to get rid of it. So for me, when he did all these assessments, I was blown away because these areas were excruciatingly painful. And I never even knew that they were painful. And here's the, here's the catch. Even if I did know they were painful, I wouldn't be thinking that they're painful because my lymph system was a problem. You follow? Yes. I would be saying, oh, well, well, my my uh, sternocleidomastoid or my tech right. miter is sore or this an, it's an irritated nerve, right? And mm -hmm. where, where they pressed first was a place that I have everybody check and you can do it now if you're watching or listening, but the largest lymph node in your neck and, and a node is kind of like a, a big giant kidney, like a filter system, right? And they gather together in clumps. And the largest one in, is in the neck is right at the top of the neck, behind the angle of the jaw, right in front, uh, right below your ear, there's that little space as high as you can get. So mm. you feel on the right with a couple of fingers, and then you feel on the left with a couple of fingers on both sides, and you see does it feel puppy? Does it feel tender? Does it feel sore or painful? And if it doesn't, that's awesome. That's what you okay. want. Right. Mine were mine were horrific. Mine were painful. And they were very swollen because they were congested, obstructed, stagnated. And see, I'm a chiropractor. So when you push there, I would originally say that's the first and second vertebra in your neck, <laughs> C1, C2. 
Yeah. And I would, I would adjust to manipulate that and then bing, bang, boom, I'm done. But the reframe for me was that is painful because the lymphatics were congested and obstructed. And then there was a lot of inflammation in there that was irritating the nerves and irritating the muscle and restricting some blood flow in my neck and into my brain, which might explain why my brain fog was so bad because I had toxicity in the brain. We'll get into it later and why this matters for the brain and how the brain uh, functions and how somebody moves and how they in interpret pain. And so he just made his way around all the lymph nodes in my body. And I hated this dude by the end of it because it <laughs> sucked, man. Like I, I said, I told this guy, I said, you have fingers of Satan, man. This is really <laughs> awful. And, and what, you'll, what you'll find is that these nodes gather around big primary joints of your body that need to move a lot because the lymphatic system it functions two primary ways through movement. So the, the more you move of yourself, the more you move the lymphatics. So movement is a great thing. And the other way is through breathing, particularly breathing through the diaphragm, which many of your listeners might know what it is, that the primary muscle that everybody uses when you breathe in and out. That changes pressure inside your body, but in particular your abdomen, and then that pumps the fluid so that that gets those areas moving and it get, keeps the fluid from being stagnant mm. like that way right and nature's pretty smart because she put all these lymph nodes these clusters you have about six to seven hundred lymph nodes in your body depending on the resources that you look at and they they clump together and they're gathered around primary joints. I showed you one at the top neck. So most of the motion in your head and the neck should happen right at the top, right there mm -hmm. is where most of it happens. And the other one is at the, the bottom of the neck at the collarbone. That's where all the lymph ends up draining to this region back to your heart, which we'll cover in a little bit when we talk about the cardiovascular system. But the other cluster around around your shoulder joints, right? Because you're supposed to move these arms like a right. lot. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? right, yeah. Reach overhead, you know, go backwards, things like that. Not just hunched forward and round and then using your thumb, your phone, mm -hmm. right? Then the other ones are in your hips and your groin. So they're designed to for your hip to go into extension and rotation and all these different moves. And uh, the other one is behind your knees because you're, you're supposed, supposed to, to walk. Yeah. You're supposed to move. Yeah. And the other one is right in your abdomen, right in the center of your abdomen that fixed what we call your quote unquote core. And that's supposed to move a lot because you're supposed to twist and rotate when you move. Right. Mm -hmm. yep. And most humans don't move. They sit too much. And when they sit, the knees are always in flexion. Mm -hmm. The hips are always flexed. The abdomen is crunched down, the shoulders are rounded forward, and the head is locked in looking at a phone, and all those joints don't move. Mm -hmm. And then they don't breathe through the diaphragm, no. and then they're breathing through their shoulders or their neck or their heart. They're probably holding their breath and not breathing at all. So they don't do either one of those, and the fluid becomes stagnant. And here's the here's the fun part because I have people in the fitness world, and this is that's what they do. It's like they say, Doc, shouldn't my lymph be really, really good? Because movement's my thing, man. That's what I do all day. And then I know about 500 different ways to breathe through the diaphragm because I've been to like 500 different breathing courses, <laughs> right? <laughs> and then but that's what I was doing, guys. I was doing the same thing. Yeah. I know movement and I know breathing, but my lymph was still a mess. And the question is why? Because what happens is through so many years of neglect or uh, having to deal with so many toxins that are coming at it from the outside world all the time, not to mention that the toxins you have that you knowingly stick down your throat, mm -hmm. which is the food that you eat. Or the toxic thoughts that you have, the stress that you have, the tension and the tightness that you have from stress, it becomes so overloaded that movement and breathing is no longer enough. You have to physically go in there and manually release the blockages. And I compare it to if lymph is mostly water. So mm -hmm. think about water coming down a stream and then it hits a 
block of rocks. Mm -hmm. It's not going to flow until you move the damn rocks, right? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we teach people to do. I'll teach you the big six later, which just means I just told you the six places Mm -hmm. that limp needs to move the most. And if you can just move those places before you actually physically move uh, and before you breathe, you'll notice a huge difference on that. And then this is where people usually ask me, well, why does the limp get so backed up? Because we're living in a world that is so toxic that the human body was not designed to have to deal with. It's just overloaded. And then nobody ever told you about it. Or even if they did, you don't know what to do about it when you learn about it, which is why I'm here. Because my story was this. When I started to work this system, or just when they assessed me, because when you assess lymph, it's the first treatment. They released a lot of toxins in my body. And I honestly, I felt like I got run over by a truck and then dropped out of an airplane without a parachute. I was like, oh my God, this sucks. But I was going through a detoxification, right? I'm getting rid of all this bad stuff. But the next day when I woke up, I was like, I mean, I'm nuts, man, but I think I feel like 30% better. Like I felt more energy. My brain was starting to wire and fire a little bit better. And I'm like, there's got to be something to this, man. And then from that point on, I was a man possessed and I just was relentless. And I kid you not, within one month of doing the lymphatics and then uh, tweaking a few things that I learned that I teach people, I lost, because I was very overweight, puffy, and swollen from uh, body fat and edema that my body laid down because I was sick. I lost 30 pounds of inflammation and fluid and waste and body fat in one month without changing anything in my training routine at all. Mm, It was just clearing the lymph and getting my system to not be so toxic. And then most people say 30 pounds. I'm in man. Whatever you tell me to do, (laughs) I'll clear the lymph. (laughs) (laughs) And plus, dude, plus I just felt better. I started to look younger. My energy came back. My brain came back. I turned into a different human being. And I thought to myself, why in the hell doesn't everybody know about this stuff? But when I looked into it and I started to try to investigate lymph, There's not a lot out there. Mm -hmm. There's more now than ever before, which is nice to see because medicine is kind of coming around. But what they did see was hard to find. But what really got me is that it was presented in such a complicated way and a very overwhelming and intimidating way Mm -hmm. that most people didn't even know. They're like, just forget it, right? I mean, you know better than anybody else that if you make something too complicated like that, people are just going to say, I... Yeah, it's nice, man, but I'm not doing it, right? Yep, um, yep. And, and the body shuts down. And here's the frustrating part. This is what really upset me. In all of my years when I was sick, not a single medical professional that I was seeing mentioned the word limp, right? Not not a single one. Yeah. And, and then and then I thought to myself, too, I said, I'm in this profession for 23 years. I didn't even know about the damn thing, right? So I, it's almost like I couldn't fault them because I didn't even know about it at that time. So my mission now is to teach everybody I can about it. You can tell I love it because I'm, I'm still answering yeah. your first question. But, uh, <laughs> and here's the biggest takeaway for me. Like all of those areas, it's kind of covering what I said before, but it's really important for people that are listening that are in fitness or healthcare because they're like, why should I care about limp? By the end of me talking today, you will. All those areas where I'm telling you about, people have musculoskeletal pain all the time. You know, sore joints, sore muscles, and we're using all of these therapies, foam rolls and guns and creams and ointments, and they're good, mm-hmm. right? But then they're designed to do what? Take away pain and heal tissue. So I was pressing in all those regions, but not thinking of what the, the lymphatics and what role they're playing. I was just focusing on fascia, ligaments, joints, nerves, lint. But why do I need to know that? Right. And and then here's the reason you need to know it. And we'll get into it more, but I'm gonna cut right to it. When you're sick or when you're injured, you need to heal. How do you heal? You have cells that are damaged that need to regenerate themselves, but you have to make new ones as well. So chronic pain and chronic disease occurs when you lose the ability to make new cells that work. Think about that for a moment. Because if you can make new cells that work, you wouldn't freaking be sick because 
yeah. make new cells. Yeah. Zippity doodah. I'm great. So that's recovery. That's regeneration. Then I thought to myself, if that's the case, what do you need to make a new cell that works? That's logical, right? Mm-hmm. And it's t- it's really comes down to two fundamental concepts. In order to have a cell that works, it needs nutrients. Agreed? Mm-hmm. And it needs nutrients, and you get that from the stuff that you eat that gives you your energy, right? And it needs oxygen. That's kind of important. So there's that breathing thing again. So it needs nutrients. And then when a cell gets nutrients and gets oxygen, it goes through different metabolic chemical reactions, energy cycles. Some of you may remember the Krebs cycle that you had to go through for your your cert or whatever. Right. But that creates that creates metabolic waste, cellular waste. Then you have cell waste, and the cell says, "Hey, and I got all this waste. I got to get rid of it." So it gets rid of the waste. But if you can't get rid of the waste, it stays inside of you, and then you start to decay. Here's the important part: even when you take in nutrients, because nutrients can't get in if waste can't get out. So the lymphatic system's job is to filter that, right? So that's why I use the body aquarium as my analogy, because people can envision this fish tank aquarium and inside the tank, you've got a lot of water and the water, if it's beautiful and clear and it has a really nice filter, what's the filter? The filter is the lymph mm-hmm. for your body, right? And that fluid in the tank, that's the fluid in you that your cells live. So I want you to think of your cells as the fish in that tank. If the water in the tank is great and you're taken care of, the fish can thrive as long as you feed them, right? Mm-hmm. But what happens if that filter system starts to go? Then the water in the tank turns green and you get fungus and you get bacteria and algae and it gets all slimy and stuff like that. And the fish start to get growths on them. Because the fish are pooping too, right? Just like your cells. And if you ever looked in a fish tank where the water was starting to go and you check out a fish and their mouth are going like this. Yeah. <laughs> Why are they doing that? Because it can't breathe. Because it can't get oxygen. Your cells do the same thing, man. They can't get the oxygen. So then what happens to them? They slowly D-I-E, die. They slowly <laughs> perish. And it doesn't matter if you keep feeding the fish, if you keep feeding the fish and putting food in, it gets more toxic, right? Mm-hmm. So when I, I asked people, said, if you want to save that fish and you want to get that tank looking good, what would you focus on? The filter, right? The filter. Mm-hmm. But we don't do that in medicine. In medicine, we do the same thing. We just replace the damn fish, right? Or, or we take the water out of the tank clean the tank, put the water back in, put new fish in, but don't touch the filter. And then two weeks later, you got the same damn problem again. So that was the answer I was looking for of why does stuff keep coming back? Why does stuff keep coming back? There's got to be something in relationship to the environment. And when you look at, you look at epigenetics, which says that, you know, it's the environment that sets the tone for your health. You cannot get well in the same environment you became ill with that. So in my world, the first thing I do when I, before I see anybody is, Limp work. Limp work. I know I went on for like 30 minutes, but that's how much I love this stuff. And hopefully you're already seeing a big picture of, holy cow, that's kind of an important system. Uh, we had seen your shift from just following you for a long time of how you've transitioned. And so that was uh, interesting. And the, the story you just gave about the fish tank analogy, Lenny Parasino and I had talked about that. And Lenny had said the same thing. He's like, we have to change our perspective on how we're viewing, how we treat our clients and, and the patients. And and so I was like, well, oh, interesting. Because he said, he goes, if a fish tank is, if you see fish dying, you automatically know what to do, but we're doing the opposite in the clinical world. And so I was like, oh, very true. So it was, it was a really eye-opening conversation I had with him. And same thing, watching you over the over the years, how you've gravitated and changed. So that's why we said, you know, together, we're like, this is something that people need to hear about. So yeah, thank you very much. You're very welcome. And And I tried to So here's the thing. When you start to talk about lymphatic systems to people, sometimes they're like, I don't even know what the hell you're talking about. Like, you know, know, lymph what? Like, uh, And why should I care? Well, first of all, if you get sick enough, you usually open your mind to possibilities. But 
when I started, when I tried to learn how to become a better communicator professionally and personally, something really stuck with me that said, and you probably know this, if you, if you want to try to teach people a concept that they've never heard before, you tie it to a concept they already know. So most people know about a fish tank. Mm -hmm. So when I explain the fish tank, then you go, okay, I got limp. I, I understand now. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what it is because it's that easy. The system, in my opinion, is the most important system in the body for survival, but it's also the most neglected system that people are not looking at. And then once you learn how to take care of it, it's very simple to do. And then here's the thing. Everybody's always working their limp. They're just doing it by accident because everybody's always moving and everybody's breathing in some way, shape or form. But you know, once you have a structured system of what well, I give a little bit to you and then you do those things. It makes a it makes a huge difference in your outcome. And also, you know, one of the things that was happening to me when I was uh, sick, my endurance was in the tank. I because I was so inflamed and because I had uh, so much swelling, uh, I couldn't absorb oxygen well, like the fish. But my cardiovascular endurance was awful, right? And I would I would literally walk up a hill and be like. I work out all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And I was on the treadmill and doing all those things. And I couldn't get the oxygen into my tissues because the lymphatic system is also part of your cardiovascular system. So the lymph, its system actually ends at the top of the neck, right at the collarbone, and it dumps into the veins of the body right before they go to the heart. So the lip attaches to the veins at the neck and the veins go to the heart and then it goes back out to the lungs and it goes back to the heart and then it goes out again through the blood flow. So if, you're, if your lymph is an issue, then your veins are an issue, which means your ability to get rid of carbon dioxide gets compromised which means your ability to actually have oxygen detached from the blood to go into the cell is compromised. So athletes who are struggling sometimes to get past a training plateau, they don't even know that the lymph might be the issue, right? Because nobody's, I have elite athletes and nobody talks about, you know, lymph issues. If you clear the lymph, then they usually can say, man, I ran like a damn gazelle, man. I was, wow. a, I was like, a boom. Because you just took the brakes off. And here's the interesting thing that you need to know in relationship to why this is really important for people in the fitness world. And remember, I told you that the lymph system's job is to take and eliminate metabolic waste, mm -hmm. cellular waste. Well, when you train and you work out, you break tissue down. That's what you do. And you want to do that because I break you down and then you recover. It's easy to break you down. Recovery is the hard part. Then you come back stronger and more resilient. You adapt it to the stress so I can give you more stress. So when you're going in and I'm spending an hour kicking my ass, I'm breaking down tissue. And what am I unleashing into my body? More waste. So I'm in the gym and I'm training, trying to become better, which is wonderful. But if you're already toxic, when you go in, you're going to add toxicity on top of toxicity. And your body has a couple of options at that standpoint. One, it usually will get to a point where it says, dude, this really sucks. And if you keep going, you're going to get worse. So why don't you just quit? And then most people end up quitting and they blame themselves because they have poor willpower. And I'm going to reframe that and say, you're probably quitting because your brain is smarter than you are. And it says, if you don't quit, you're going to die. <laughs> so don't do anymore. Or what it does is it actually makes you fatter mm. because one of the things that your body does, if you can't get rid of waste effectively, it has to find a way to protect you. One of the ways it protects you is it makes you more inflamed. It holds on to fluid. You retain fluid. You actually produce a lot more mucus in your body, but you become fatter because your body uses fat cells to surround the toxicity to take it away from vital structures. So an inability to lose body fat is significantly tied to the lymphatic system. That's why I dropped 30 pounds of not just body fat, but inflammation and cellular waste in a month. So there's a lot of people that are stuck right at that one level. And I'm not saying you have to quit training. 
what I'm saying is you just start to release the lymphatics and in a very specific sequence, because if you don't do it in this right sequence, you don't get the same results. And then you just let the body do its thing. I mean, that's a really important thing for people to understand. Kelly Starrett, who's a good friend of mine who wrote the Supple Leopard, you know, across the body, he says very similar. He said, garbage out, groceries in. That means get the crap out, then put the nutrients in. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, it, it doesn't matter if you put nutrients in because if the nutrients can't get into the cells, I don't care what the hell you eat. It doesn't matter. So that means you got to get the garbage out first. So the order makes all the difference in the world when you do it. When it comes to assessing this, right? You said you had someone go in there and go to all the lymph areas. Is that the only way to assess this? Pretty much. People in my world are really usually in bad shape when they come to see me. Chronic pain, autoimmune. I'm not the first cat you see. I'm the last one. Like, 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 okay, this guy's nuts, but I've been everywhere else. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> you can't do like a blood test to see if your lymph is an issue. And blood tests for so many people show up within normal ranges, but they feel terrible. It happens so much, so often. But one of the reasons that is, is because your brain does, your body does everything it can to keep blood normalized. And that's the last place that stuff shows up, even though you're really sick. There's no like MRI I can give you to say your lymph needs an issue. Once you're familiar with lymph, it'll be by the symptoms that somebody has. And here's the thing. It can be like any, any symptom you can think of. <laughs> I mean, it can be so many of them. But I usually tell people, if you, the more symptoms you have, the more likely that you have lymph issue. And then it's knowing where to assess these regions on the body. And then you look for puffiness or swelling or tenderness that you have around an, an area or uh, pain in those regions. Those usually be your best indicators for that. And then that's how you know. Here's the beautiful thing about it is that when you assess these areas, when you assess, you start to free stuff up that's already stuck there just from your assessment, because the nodes gather. And when the nodes get obstructed, you need to just manually go in there and stimulate around a region to free stuff up, right? It's just kind of like going in and removing the rocks from the stream that are, that are backed up, right? We do that. And just the assessment, most people say, wow, that was kind of tender, or that was kind of painful, puffy, bloated, things like that. They're usually the biggest symptoms that you you have. And once you know how to look for them, it's very, very easy to find. And here's my, here's my running joke. I usually tell people, how do you know you have a lymph problem? And I'm like, well, I make it very simple. You're breathing. <laughs> That's how I know you have a lymph problem. So you, you, need, you need to have some work done on it because I'm pretty sure nobody has. And if you come to see me through this door, I'm in my office, I already know it's going to be an issue in some way, shape or form because people have had things for many, many years. I don't know how much of a significant role it's going to play, but I know it is going to play a role in it because this, because um, the, all the other systems of your body that we're trying to affect, they live inside the tank. So that's why you want to do lymphatic work first before you do the other things all right, of all different types. And then that's it. Very, very simple. So it's probably pretty difficult to find practitioners then that are to have comprehensive knowledge of how to handle the lymphatic system. Uh, it, it really is. Honestly, there's not many people that are familiar with it in the medical community because nobody ever talked about it to me. But even if they are, they don't really know what to do about it. Maybe you'll hear something of like, okay, this you ever heard of a compression socks or people get swelling in their feet and ankles when they fly on a plane, stuff mm -hmm. like that? That's kind of like lymph issues, edema issues. Then they'll usually tell you to get some type of compression sock or stocking or things like that. Why, why would that work? Because they're compressing fluid and trying to move fluid up, up and out, right? Mm -hmm. So even if they did hear about it, they wouldn't know what to do about it. And I was trying to empower people to, to know, first of all, know about it because that that's in and of itself is really empowering because if you don't know what you don't know, right? but it's like, you can't unsee it once you know about it, mm -hmm. then you'll look for it. And 
here's the thing that happens when, when I, because I spend two days talking about this system and I tie it to in-depth explanation of how it ties to all the other systems of your mind. I'm going to blow your mind up and then I'm going to show you how to take care of it. When I show you how to take care of it, this is the response that I always get. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Because because I build it up, I build it up, I build it up, and they're expecting this huge, like big, complicated thing. And I'm like, no, like all you got to do is rub and slap these six places, and you're gonna be good, right? And then because it's basic, it's fundamental, and those are the ones that are the building blocks for everything else above. So they're blown away by it, and they they don't think it will work because it's so simple. And then here's the next thing they say: if this stuff was so powerful. Why the hell didn't somebody tell me about it a long time ago? Right, mm-hmm. and then I, my answer is always the same. That's a really good question because I'm asking yeah. myself that every day. They should have. Effective things don't have to be complicated, and then so they have that initial reaction of it can't. It can't be that simple. But Dan John, one of my my favorite people in the world, coach Dan John, also said people don't realize how difficult it is to make something simple. So I make it look simple for you because I've done the heavy lifting on your part. Uh, And I want you to understand why rubbing and slapping these six places is so powerful because people who see it and don't understand it or sometimes mock it because it seems so simple. That tells me one thing. They don't know jack squat about physiology and neurology. That's what that tells me because if you do, you would understand why that is so powerful by the end. So I want to arm people with that knowledge so they could do that. And then the second reaction that they get is they actually get angry because then they get upset because they needlessly suffered for so long and nobody told them about the system, which is understandable. And, and that, that's been my mission now to have every person that I talk to expose them to it. Because I want them to feel the way that I felt, the, the changes that I experienced. And I'm like, I'm, I'm no s- special human body unicorn that is going to react and different than anybody else, that other people could do that too. And I slowly began to teach this stuff and fine tune it in, in my practice by working with people and seeing the responses that they had. And and changing things up based on reactions. And then that's when I decided to, I wasn't sure if it was something that I started to teach if people would really be interested in it or not, right? Because like you said before, lymph what? Why would I need to know about that? So I put together a self-help video a couple of years ago, and it was like a two-hour video. I just hired a video guy, and I said, let's do this. It's called Body Aquarium, Lymphatic. Like mojo. And mojo just means magic. That's why I chose that word because the stuff is kind of magical of, of how it helps. And I just put it out there. This thing went absolutely viral, insane nuts. Like I, people just started using it and then they were getting better. And I was getting messages. I still get messages every day from people who say, thank you. Like this was the coolest thing I've ever seen. I've never seen anything like this. And they share all these stories of almost every conceivable condition or age group that had a change for the better. And they're like, I never knew. Uh, You were the first one to talk about it. And then that's when I thought, well, maybe I'll try to put a course together and see if people would like more information. Because that was the two-hour video made for humans. Like, I, I make this very simple. People ask me all the time, I'm not a healthcare professional. Can I come learn about Lent? And my answer is always the same. If you're a human being, you can come to my course. Because Uh, Make it fundamental for you to understand because you should be empowered. You should learn about this system because it's your responsibility to don't leave it up to medicine to learn about it because they won't. And then they tune on in and I started to put these workshops together and then it kind of grew organically uh, from there at this stage now. It's been really a wonderful thing to see from people that give the feedback on it. And uh, I have a lot of people in the fitness industry. And I really wanted to get it towards them too, because people in the fitness industry, first of all, really, really smart. So many of them are smarter than a lot of medical people that I know in relationship to movement. They are actually on the front lines as gatekeepers. They 
see people who have underlying things long before this person feels they need to go to a doctor to see. And we teach people how to do foam rolling, right? We teach people how to do stretching. We teach people how to do acupressure points on each other. And we teach self-help things all the time. I just wanted to introduce this so trainers could teach what I teach them to the people as well. And you can do it. So the only difference is you're putting these tools that you already use on very strategic places in a specific order. But now you're not thinking about, I'm putting the foam roller on my pec minor. You're mm -hmm. thinking, I'm putting the foam roller on my pectoral and axillary lymph nodes. That's what I want you to think about. That's the difference. You're already doing these things now, guys. I just want you to realize what, what it is you're actually affecting when you're in there. And then when you realize the power that you have, that's transformational in mm -hmm. so many different ways. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Very true. I would imagine with the, the massage work, the pressure changes, right? Because you, you probably don't want to be too aggressive with this. Yeah. So here's the thing that I changed up to where I've studied a lot of different disciplines in many different parts of the world where I mix Eastern medicine and Western medicine and my years of studying martial arts and uh, Tai Chi and Nigong and Qigong and many things from uh, Asia. And I've studied um, osteopathic medicine mm -hmm. a lot. When you look at lymphatic or traditional lymphatic, it was notoriously really, really light, very superficial, almost like you're barely touching tissue, which is great, right? And, and it, 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 it can work and it's beneficial. I kind of turned that on its head a little bit where I mixed in the stuff that I've learned and all those other techniques and brought it to what I learned. So my techniques are, um, I use the term aggressive, but I don't want people to think that that means painful. Aggressive means that I go uh, deeper into tissues, like you're almost getting a massage and different types of uh, directions that we're doing. And because what I want to do is that when you study the lymph, you've got different parts of lymph. You, you say you've got 700, 800 lymph nodes in your body, right? But you've got Three primary areas in your body where most of your lymph resides. The neck is one. So if I've got 700 lymph nodes, six to 700 in that ballpark, one third of that number, think about this for a moment. One third of that number is from the neck up to your head. What that tells me is this, uh, your head and your neck are probably pretty important, <laughs> right? <laughs> so if nature saw fit to put that much drainage here, and so I know that when somebody's suffering chronic pain anywhere in the body, it's usually going to be congestion in the neck and head somewhere, usually always. The other place is the skin. The skin is a huge amount of lymphatics just below the surface. Everywhere in the body, that is, skin is very superficial, right? So it's near the surface. So that's why if you just rub or tap or do brushing, some people have seen dry brushing to do lymph, it moves that superficial lymph. But the superficial lymph actually has to go down into the next layer of lymph. It's just a little bit deeper. And those are in those clusters of the shoulders and the neck and the groin and the knee. So those are those gather stuff from the skin. And then once they hit those nodes, they have to travel even deeper. And then those are going to travel into the deep structures near the abdomen and near the spine. Those are the deepest lymph. So the third place that you have most of your lymph is in your gut and your abdomen, particularly your intestines. And that's really important because the lymphatics are part of your immune system. And the majority of your immune system, we know from medicine, resides in your intestines. 70 to 80 percent of your strength as for your entire immune system is in your gut. So if the gut becomes compromised and people have what's called malabsorption syndrome or leaky gut syndrome or irritable bowel syndrome or Crohn's disease or anything, I mean, humans are just wrought with so many digestive issues right now. 
Anytime stuff breaks through the gut, it's not supposed to break through the gut. Your immune system sees it as an invader, and the first thing to greet it is lymph. So that's why the lymphatics can give you that very puffy and bloated, and you get a lot of inflammation around the abdomen. But because those sit so deep, if the deep lymphatics get blocked in the abdomen and the groin, then it'll create a backflow into the arms, into the legs, into the head. If you do the superficial lymph really, really light, like on the skin and around those joints that I mentioned, that's a good first step. But you're ultimately going to have to go really, really deep to get the ones in the abdomen, uh, behind the sternum, and then into the neck, because that's the big block. And it's very important that you understand how lymph flows in the body. And it's based on the laws of how fluid moves. And physics is called hydrodynamics. Mm -hmm. And I just want you to think of water because the lymph is mostly water. And water and fluid in hydrodynamics goes from high pressure to low pressure. High, it'll naturally go to the lower pressure. The easiest way you can think about it is a water dam that has a lot of pressure on one side and none on the other. Mm -hmm. If I lift the dam, what happens? <laughs> right? Everything goes. That's exactly what it is for lymph. So the lowest pressure for lymph, where it's always trying to travel to, is right above the collarbone. That's the lowest pressure in the body of the veins as they go back to the heart. So if that's the lowest pressure, then the highest pressure are going to be the furthest away from the neck. Yes. So it's going to be the top of your head, your hands, and your feet. So they're trying to send everything into that collarbone region. But they better not hit any blocks along the way. So if something is coming, let's say you twist your ankle on your left-hand side, and it's swollen. It's supposed to be swollen because the inflammation is there to protect you and to heal you. And swelling, by the way, is an immune system response. People need to understand that. It's not a, it's not a musculoskeletal response. It's an immune system response. And so the idea is that you swell, you create waste from the swelling, and it has to go out. So now we know that the swelling in that ankle has to go all the way to your neck all the way to your collarbone. But in order to get there, it's got to get past those places that I told you before. It's got to get past the back of the knee. It's got to get past the groin. It's got to get past your abdomen. It's got to get past the chest. And then it's got to get to the neck. But I ask people is that what happens if you've got something blocked behind the knee that's, a, that's on that ankle side? All that swelling is going to go right to the knee, and then it's going to stay in your ankle because it can't get out, right? Not only can it can't get out, but what can't get down there? The stuff that you need to heal the ankle, yeah. the, the nutrients and the oxygen, right? That has mm -hmm. to get there, too. And the reason I said the sternum is because the abdomen there, the largest lymph node in your body, by the way, which is about the size of a walnut, sits right in your abdomen about two inches up from your navel. And that takes all the lymph flow from the organs in your lower body right to that guy. And then from there, it goes along this pipe, this trunk called lymphatic trunk that runs right behind your sternum. And then it goes up and splits off and it goes to the left side of your neck, left side of your neck. So the interesting thing about the lymph is it's not even from side to side. Your right side of your neck above the collarbone is called a lymphatic duct. And that dumps into the veins. That dumps things from your right arm, the right head and neck, your right rib cage and right torso go to the right side of your neck. The rest of your entire body goes to the left side. So the left side is the big driver. So if you twist your ankle, it goes to the left. If I jacked up my right knee, it goes to the left. If I jack up my low back, where does it go? Left Where's side. The left, left. Oh. Right? So it's very interesting, too, if you think about swelling on the back of the body. So if you've got pain in the middle of your back, the pain in the middle of your back actually has to travel around your back and go into the shoulder in the front. So that's where the swelling goes around the front into that pec region.
If you have a swollen lower back and you've got a herniated disc and you're really painful on the back, all that swelling has to travel around your glutes and around your waist to your groin. And it goes from your groin deep into your abdomen up to your neck. So what I tell people is that you never want to do anything to try to reduce inflammation in the back of your body until you clear the front of your body first. Because if I've got swelling in my back, what happens if I'm trying to reduce swelling in the back from like ultrasound or muscle stem or ice or heat or laser or whatever tool of the day you want to use because they all work. I got to make sure that the groin can take the inflammation, you follow? Mm -hmm. If you do that, first, then you notice a huge difference in your outcome. So it's just a reframe of the order that you're doing things in. And then when people see it that way, they're like, well, holy cow, that makes a whole lot of sense. I'm like, I know it does. It does. <laughs> yeah. Cause you got, and it's easy to do. Yeah. A lot of Americans have, a lot of people have had their tonsils removed. What is your perspective on that in regards to the, its effect on the lymphatic system, especially since that's a procedure that's done usually at a pretty young age. Yeah, I know they try not to do that as much as possible like they used to. Yeah, I mean, they used uh, to be really. They try not. Yeah. Yeah, because they notice they usually have problems later on. But it, listen, guys, Mother Nature doesn't put anything inside of you that she doesn't think you need. Mm -hmm. And just because you can take it out doesn't mean it's not supposed to be there. Yeah. So you can take your appendix out and be okay, but your appendix is a big part of fighting infection too. And same with your spleen. That your spleen is the largest lymph organ you've got. It's part of your lymphatic system. But you can live without your spleen. And But if you take away the largest part of your lymphatic system, then the rest of the system is going to have to step up and do more. So you can become overloaded and overburdened because you don't have one. And you, you may be more prone to immune system issues and infection issues. It doesn't mean you will. Everybody has a different ability to adapt to pathogens. I mean, we see that right now with COVID. Some people get it, some people don't get it, right? So same with tonsils. But your tonsils are set up underneath there. They're a huge part of your lymphs. They're called a lymphoid organ. And when you take those out, then you will have an overburden on the rest of the lymph nodes in the neck, particularly that large one that sits behind the jaw. And then the ones that, goes, that go along the throat, on the sides of the throat, they're called your deep lymphatics. and the deep lymphatics actually take the drainage from the brain. And what happened to me, was, which I didn't tell you before, is about 18 years ago, I think now, I had cancer. I had thyroid cancer. So oh. my thyroid gland swelled up. I had a goiter, which means it's just like, just like I had a tennis ball on the bottom of my neck. It had to be removed because it was malignant, but it spread through some of the lymph nodes in my neck because the lymph sits very closely right next to the thyroid. And that's why many people, women especially who have breast cancer, they usually remove a lot of lymphatics at the same time because it's kind of spread or crept into it. And it can spread cancer throughout the system. But here's the interesting thing. The lymphatics also kill cancer all the time, every day. That's one of the reasons why you don't have cancer is because it kills it keeps it under control. So they had to remove a substantial amount of lymph nodes in my neck 12, 18 years ago. And at the time, I didn't think twice about it because I'm like, all right, no worries. <laughs> but you know, later on, subsequently, like 13 years later, right, then I developed this more autoimmune things. And I was very prone to sinus congestions, <clears throat> post-nasal drip, clearing my throat all the time. And now I know why, because when they remove these lymph nodes, your body will always find a way to reroute something. You know, that's what it does, right? And with lymph, it's called, big word, it's called lymphangiogenesis. Genesis just means kind of new life, right? Yeah. So it'll, it'll try to spider out. And in, in medicine, they call it anastomosis. Anastomosis just means that you're going to try to connect to something somewhere else, like spider webs. And it'll find a way to drain as best it can. It will never drain the way it did when you had them, mm -hmm. because that's why you had them. Right? <laughs> so you'll be prone to having a little bit more congestion or stagnation and things like that. So to answer your question, if you do remove those, there have been people that notice that they 
might be more prone to issues up in the head and the neck uh, <laughs> later in life, but, but not always. So I don't want people that have had them removed to yeah. freak out or anything. It's okay. But it just means that you should definitely get your lymphatic system checked out, right? Which, which I think everybody should just to get a really, you know, I'll even show you guys how you check the six places. Cause when you assess the six places, you actually free up the six places. So then how do you, so how do we check the six places then? Perfect segue. <laughs> Perfect segue. Uh, all right. So, we go. so basically it's just through touch pressure and a little bit of the massage side to side. So you'll press in on the areas that I'm telling you to do. And people always say, how hard? I'm like, well, go start easy and then press in and go side to side easy. And you're looking for if it's painful if it's tender, if one side feels a little bit more puffy or tense than the other. Now, tension can be from muscles, but I want you to pay attention to tension because when you have excess tension, tension decreases fluid flow, mm. right? Okay. Because the tissue's mm -hmm. tight, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so I usually tell people, if you want to try to press in enough pressure to go in about a half an inch into the tissue. And I think if that's in centimeters, that's maybe 1.5 centimeters, maybe something like that, approximate. But, you know, don't overthink it. That's what I'm telling you. So I want you to go above the collarbone on the left. Mm -hmm. So you got the collarbone and I want you to go above that and feel in that region if it's puffy or swollen. There's got that little space right there. So mm -hmm. don't go too far out. I want you to kind of split the distance of the clavicle, the collarbone, and just go right there and feel pressing there. And then now press in and go side to side and do little circles. Right. And then I want you to do the same thing on the other side. So press a, in. Get some tension in there. Yeah, a little sore. Yeah, and, and then just kind of do circles, clockwise, counterclockwise, pressing in and out, right? So why do you go there first? Because if you're, if you're stuck there, then everything else trying to go into it gets stuck. So that's the drain point, right? That's mm -hmm. like, if I got a stuck drain in my house, let me just unclog the drain and then fluid will automatically go in. There. And that's an area where there's a, a tight fascial band that sits there and that can really constrict flow there, especially if you breathe through your shoulders and your neck like that. So that's number one. I already showed you number two. Number two is at the top of the neck, right behind the angle of the jaw, below the ear. So you take a couple of fingers and you rub up and down right there. Left side, right side. Okay. Okay. that's number two. Now we do number three. So number three is an area that most people in the fitness world are familiar with. It's right where your pec minor sits. If you're not familiar with where that is, it's find your shoulder, yep. <laughs> come forward on the shoulder as it attaches to the pec there. And I want you to put your fingers and just press all along around that shoulder joint on the inside. So right where it's round and it's no longer round, that's where I want you to press all along there. That is what they call your pectoral slash axillary, which is your armpit. That's where mm -hmm. those reside. Very, very important. Then you do the same thing on the other side. You always want to check both sides. Okay? And that one you're going to have to push in a little bit deeper. right? So now I don't think pec minor, think lymph nodes. Got it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to have to stand up to show yep. you the other ones. The other one that is going to be in your uh, abdomen. So this is going to be number four. This is going to be six total. Hopefully you guys can see me here. So we've got the belly button mm -hmm. right here. And then you've got straight up and down your abdomen here. Mm -hmm. right? So what I usually do is I have people take their fingers and they put them side by side. And I want them to put it right below the bottom of the sternum at the top of your, ab your abs, right in the middle. Mm -hmm. And then I want you to press in about one inch or three centimeters. And when you press in, I want you to go side, 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 side as you're pressing in. Then I want you to move down, but don't skip any spaces. 
Move your fingers down and press in one inch and go side, 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 side. Press in and go down side, side, side. Down. And you go all the way to the belly button. Don't go in the belly button. Stop on the top of the belly button above it. And Does this side, change side, if you're side. seated or standing? Um, just by position, it might be more comfortable for somebody to get it seated to standing. Okay. It really doesn't matter position wise on feeling it. You may like one more than the other. I'm just showing you here so you can see what I'm doing. Okay. Right. Okay. And then, then you've got your navel, right? Your mm -hmm. belly button. All I want you to do now is envision this small ring around your belly button. Mm -hmm. It's a few inches. And I just want you to do circles around that belly button in about five or six places as you press in and you do circles and see if it's uh, tender, tight, painful, burning. You know, some people feel like, damn, it feels like I got cottage cheese in my belly. That's, that's <laughs> congested length, oh. right? So that right there will start to free up toxins because a lot of toxins reside around the navel. Right. Mm. Then we do five. Five is the groin region. So the groin, right? So the groin, you've got the crease, right? When you mm -hmm. bend your yep. leg up, you've got a crease. You're going to feel all along the crease, but more towards the outside of the crease. So if you got a line there, go more towards the outside and feel along the whole thing from the big bone you feel in the front that's part of your pelvis all the way down to as close as you can can get to the to the groin that you feel comfortable feeling and then do the same on the other side and that's what they call the inguinal lymph nodes yeah. inguinal lymph nodes okay and then the last one is called popliteal this is number six it's behind the knee so feel behind your knee Same circular and patterns. You, yeah, it really doesn't matter how oh, you check okay. it. You you like circles, you can go side to side, you can go up and down. I usually like for people to do many different patterns because you're also releasing tissue at the same time. So all of those areas you would always compare side to side. And here's the beautiful thing. When you assess it in that order, that's exactly how the lymph wants to drain. So what you did there was actually assessing the lymph, but it was also treating the lymphatics the same way. So now that you know where those six are, how you assess them is exactly how you would release them, right? And then here's where I make it really easy for people. And I say, the order is the most important. That's the concept. So the concept is you need to open up the tightness or restrictions so the lymph fluid can drain where it wants to drain. Now, the technique part is the one I really don't care about. That means I don't honestly care what you do to those six places, as long as you do those six places the way I showed you. Because sure. then they say, Doc, can, can I go in a circle? I'm like, well, hell, do whatever the hell you want to do. Can, <laughs> can I go up and down? Yes. Can, can I go fast? Can I go slow? Can I go hard? Can I go light? I'm like, yeah, just don't cause pain. And then you're good. And you can use a brush on there. You, you can use, you can tap there. You can just rub there. You can, you, you can put little vibration tools there. It, it doesn't really matter. Right. And so that's what I have my people when I teach that they show their clients or you do that to yourself. That's every day, and you'll keep those areas really, really moving quite well. That's, that's like the basic. And then I teach the advanced stuff where we go deeper, and then we show you how to move actual organs around that might have might be stuck or congested in that region. And because uh, some people need, need to go deeper. That mm -hmm. This is great for like every human to do. But the longer you've had issues, the more you're going to have to go in a little bit deeper on some things. And then that's what we teach you. But I always do basics and fundamentals. And for me, this is my load and carry. Like you pick up heavy stuff and you put it down. 
then you do your big six. That's like my thing, right? And if you do that, that'll make you a monster, just like loaded carries will. So now once you get all the, you know, your lymph flowing well, is there a, a certain type of training modality that you, you like to, to get it to keep moving well, or does it come more down to the self-assessment and the t- constant touch? Yeah. So the, the touch part is really critical because that's going to get the manual release part. Then uh, lymph moves by movement, right? So I, I like all forms of movement. So I have this thing that I teach called 4M motion, which just means it's very simple premise. I want you to move more of yourself than you do now, move more often than you do now, (laughs) (laughs) move in, move in more ways than you do now and do it in more environments, do it in different places than you do now. And then I'm happy, like I make it simple. The easiest one is one of the things that we don't really do anymore as humans or as adults is just jumping up and down a little bit on the balls of your feet, like on a trampoline or Uh jump rope, because what you're doing is you're like a big giant slosh pipe. I'm going up and down and then fluid is moving this way. Yeah. And so when you release everything, right. And then it's like a jackhammer, bam, 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 bam. Right? And you do that for about uh, a minute and that'll really get stuff moving and going. The thing about the lymph is that it's very interesting. People can develop issues in the body with, with pain or discomfort or because they don't move a lot, right? So they, they become stagnant and, and tissue can become restricted and tense and tight or what they call mechanical deformation with stuff just deforms, kind of kind of like a callus, right? And then fluid gets stuck. But you also have to keep in mind this, that if you do the same kind of movement all the time, you can get stagnation mm-hmm. because fluids conform to what you're doing all the time. Like it's like rocks. See, there's a pattern that goes that it's just going to follow because that's the path. And so your body's the same way. If you always do the same routine, if I always do the same exercises or in the same order and stuff like that, you also can get really messed up and then fluid moves around that. So that's why I like a lot of variety or your variation, variability and play and stuff like that, you know, and why jumping up and down works so well because not a lot of people do it. And I think it, it travels back to what I said before is that sometimes it's those simple and basic things that we don't even think about that can make such a big difference. I, I got to tell you a funny story here. You know, I teach this, it's called a pedal pump and pedal means feet, right? Mm-hmm. And pump is pump and pedal pump is, is a move that they teach you in osteopathic medicine where Someone would be lying flat on the table, and then you would go to the foot of the table, and you put your hands underneath the balls of their feet, and you press the balls of the feet up towards the head. And then what happens is the whole person moves, right? Mm -hmm. Like a jackhammer. That's the exact same thing you do when you're standing up on your two feet. You're just standing when you do that jackhammer. And they do that movement to move fluid. And I'm like, holy hell. I mean, you're like, we got built-in trampolines, bro. Those are called calves, right? You can just <laughs> jump up and down. Right. And, and, and it's so energetic. You know, and I teach that move. But here's what happens. When you're in the fitness world for so long, those things look so boring to you that you want this new shiny, complicated, crazy thing that I need 50 toys to juggle at the same time in order for me to cool move. And I'm like... You got to remember, you're talking to humans where they need basics and fundamentals. And sometimes we don't, we neglect those because they look boring. I'm going to send this point home because I I posted up on my Instagram channel, the pedal pump, which I call the fighter bounce, because I just want people to kind of dance around on their toes, you know, like they're in a ring, like a fighter's warming up, you know, like Conor McGregor used to do. And he's getting ready. He's getting energy up, right? Priming up for competition. It was a 14 second video and I didn't even have any sound on it. I just showed it. The thing went ballistic viral where people said, that was amazing. I can't believe how much better I felt just from jumping up and down on that thing. And it was so simple and almost every person can do it. 
And when you realize what that does physiologically to your body, it's absolutely freaking phenomenal what that mm-hmm. does to your whole nervous system and in your body. And that's all I want people to do. So if you could do those, honestly, you could do those six places, then jump up and down in one place for one minute, you're going to change your life. And I'm not kidding you. If you do that every single day, you're going to be a hashtag monster. You really are, right? And the other one is uh, the move that I teach all the time that I learned from uh, Dan John and my good friend, Dr. Philip Beach. And it's just where you learn to control your own body mass against gravity. So you go down to the ground and back up again, a lot of different ways, 50 times a day. You're going to move some serious fluid around. Yeah. If you do that, if you do that and you're going to make yourself ungodly strong at the same time. And unfortunately, those are my favorites. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't think most people go up and down from the ground 50 times in a month. Sometimes yeah. <laughs> I just think about, uh, yeah, my daughter right now who's, who's, she's got a trampoline and she's jumping on that thing all the time and she, she doesn't stop moving. So she's getting up and down off the ground like a thousand times a day, all, you know, and in all different ways all, all the time. Times. And this is just something that, you know, she just does naturally. She doesn't think about it or what it's doing. And she just knows, Hey, this feels good. This is fun. Yeah. Well, it's just kind of innate. It's built into human nature. That's how you you develop your stabilization and your strength. It takes an enormous amount of strength to control your own body mass against in, in all situations, but arising from the floor, first of all, it'll save your life. When you learn how to control yourself going up and down to the floor, it looks simple, but it will tire you very fast. And one of the things that I usually talk about a lot is that the people overthink movement oh. too much. So yes. it's not, it's not that I don't want you to think about, I usually like for you to be more aware when you move, but not obsessive compulsive disorder. When you move, throw, throw in the up and down things mixed in with, whatever you're trying to do to nail very specific positions that you're doing. Because you find that when you're trying to teach people to move, uh, to get comfortable with movement or move differently, if they're worried about moving wrong, they're going to be extra tense and tight and stiff, and they're not going to move authentically. And they're going to have stress and anxiety. I'm going to feed the beast I'm trying to change. And I want to be able to empower people to, to feel that they can move when I'm not there. That's that's part of your job as a coach is to educate but empower and not have people d- depend on you. And trust me, don't worry that if you teach them these things that you're going to lose them as a client. It will be the exact opposite. <laughs> yeah. You gain a loyalty because you show right. them something that, and you've given them something that somebody else hasn't been able to do. Right. Ex- exactly. People become scared to move because they've been hurt in the past. It's very funny that way because when you expect it to hurt when you move, it usually hurts when you move. And it's like that self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Or they become disempowered because they've had such judgment about good movement versus bad movement. So I I no longer use the term good and bad. I just use the term different because um they're they're neither one of those exist um for the brain. The brain doesn't know good and bad. I I learned to study neuroscience. It was very transformational for me where the brain doesn't think in terms of good or bad. It thinks in terms of utility. Is it useful or is it not useful? Mm -hmm. The good and bad is the context that we put on. And it'll do whatever it thinks is useful, whether it makes sense to you or not. And then that's my phrase where the human body is under no obligation to make sense to you. It doesn't care whether you get it or not. It doesn't give a crap. It's just going to keep doing its thing because it thinks it's useful. And you're like, but why is it, why is it swelling that up all the time? That's, that's not good. And I'm like, I don't care whether you think it's good. The body thinks it's useful. And we just have to figure out why it's doing what it's doing. That's all. That's a big reframe for, for people, right? So all movement to me is useful. This really changed the, the dynamic of how I teach quote unquote corrective exercise. I don't I don't even like the word corrective because it implies yeah. something is broken. Is exploration. So let's say if I can indulge for a second, I know we're coming to the end, but let's say if you would get somebody down into all fours, right? Uh, um, where their hands are on the ground, their knees are on the ground, and their toes are on the ground. So they have six points of stabilization. And then you may want to do the uh, ever popular cat camel 
or you want to do the what they call the bird dog where you'll mm -hmm. extend one arm out and then your opposite leg goes out and you try to balance and everybody's trying to cue you to get into this magical mythical neutral pelvic tilt whatever whatever it is right <laughs> and you, you're, you don't live in neutral pelvis i mean you're all over the freaking map when you get up off the floor so you need to be quote unquote neutral you need to be posterior you need to be anterior you gotta explore it all so if when i'm putting you in that position i'm gonna let you do the movement the way you want to do the movement because you're going to do the movement what the way that's most comfortable for you that you're that you're aware of. So I'm going to let you own it there. And then I'm just going to uh, let, I'm going to explore different extremes, right? So I'm not going to say I want you in neutral. Uh, maybe I'll say that, but I'm like, okay, if you have a really bad arch in your lower back, I'm going to let you do it that way. And then I'm going to say, okay, now what I want you to do is go, go completely opposite the other way, not an arch, but you're like, you're like freakishly, this feels weird. This doesn't feel right, doc. Do it that way. And then I want you to split it in the middle. The reason I do that is because I need your brain to feel comfortable doing it that whole spectrum. Because yeah. at some point in time, when you're out in real life and you're lifting up the groceries, where you're going to get hurt is that one spectrum that you don't visit. That's yeah. where you're going to get hurt. So you need to play around with that. And then you just, so I do multiple repetitions in all of those planes because that's what life is. You know, because when you're out in real life, you don't have time to think. I gotta, I gotta tuck my stuff up underneath. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta brace my transverse abdominis and lift the groceries up. You know, that stuff just doesn't exist. I'm like, first of all, if that ever happens, your competition just steamrolled your ass because they're already in the end zone, right? That's just not applicable. So I need to take stuff that we do in here that can transfer to you out there. Right. You get to get things to happen without having to think things are happening. That's why one of the things I love what you guys have that was like when you show you guys have so many uh, like awesome magical moves and combinations that I God, you guys have such a great repertoire of stuff. But when when you, you said I was at your course and you said, I want to take this stick, man, and push the stick up into the ceiling, then hold on to that stick and then just squat down on my Dude, you guys are like wizards, man. That's like the lowest <laughs> I've ever gotten in my life. <laughs> thing. You know what? Because it just... I, I, I have that video still. That's one of the year... <laughs> that I sh you know, some people, I'll be like, you got to check this out. Watch Perry Nicholson and watch his reaction. It's awesome to see when you can introduce people and let them know that, yes, you can move better than you think you can. Right. Or what you've right. been told. And so it, it is, it's an awesome reaction and it, and it never gets old. Like, it, like I, we love seeing people just discover new things and that wide eyed expression. That's what drives us to keep doing what we do. Yeah. I mean, it, it shows too, you know, the energy you guys have, with the way you teach and that you're very creative in the way you put things together that, that people can do and they have fun when they do it. Um, but yeah, so many people just need to get out of their own way in relationship to, to movement. Right. And then, uh, so that's a great way to do that. So I, cause it's funny because I, I know getting in a squat position for me is like one of the was not anymore, but one of the most challenging things for me to get into. And then, so when I did the stick, that was like, I, you know, I found the wizard of Oz on that one. I really did. <laughs> Uh, yeah, because that was our first time we'd met. That was up in San Francisco. You were out here for Dr. Emily yeah. uh, Spickle's uh, summit, so that was uh, I know. that was the first time we yeah. met. And uh, I I was nervous as shit meeting you. To be honest with you, I was like, holy shit, because <laughs> uh, uh, Chris Flores yeah. was with us, right? So he's yeah, like, it was. Uh, we all went out for. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for coming on, Perry. You know, we, we love what you teach. Uh, keep up the good work. Uh, we need more of it. And hopefully for coaches and trainers out there that are listening, hopefully you're evolving this in the same realm. You know, you start out a certain way, but then you have to every four to five years, you should see some significant or maybe even subtle changes in your perspectives or approaches and to how you see movement and how you see fitness. Yeah, absolutely. Forever a student, always learning, right? And yeah. for me, I mean, I, the context of how I've come over the years and different things that I see and, and learn, that's that beginner's mindset, right? That, yeah. Right.
always need to keep. And I, I thank you very much for having me on the show. I know that you'll ask a question and like 30 minutes later, I'm still going, but I, uh, <laughs> that's I, what we wanted. Know, no, that's I, what we wanted. Cause it's I, all great information. Yeah. Can you give uh, people, where can they find you on websites, social media and, and programs? Like what, what are you teaching or where can they have access to this? Yeah. Dennis and I need to take oh, this. Great. Thank you guys course, for sure. Yeah. I mean, it's really easy to find. I've been, I've been pumping out content for a long time, but if you go on, just type in stop chasing pain. That's my brand. Stop chasing pain. I'll show up somewhere. Uh, <laughs> you know, and my, uh, my website will pop on up. And when you go there, that's kind of the central hub for everything. We've got a category for workshops and I, I teach three different ones. I have the body aquarium one. I teach a primal movement based one. That's my favorite ground based movement program. And then one that I launched this year that's called fluid force systems. It's all about moving blood flow, not just lymph flow and in, in, in the region. And then I have um, you know membership site that people can join if they want to. And you can purchase um, if you just want to do one shot videos. It's all listed on the homepage. And I'd like to be able to save people. I have my own podcast as well. I've had a, a Stop Chasing Pain podcast is ten years old this year. Um, so yeah, you can go listen to that where I sat down and talked to a lot of people smarter than me to try to help me be better. And then you can share in that. Uh, as well. And probably the best place you can find me is I think I'm on there, maybe an unhealthy amount, which is Instagram. <laughs> uh, that's that's probably the best place to, to get me. <laughs> Dude, I checked the other day. I had like 7,000 posts on that thing. Uh, so I got a lot because I just, I just love sharing information. And when I see something that's cool, I just pop it up and, you know, it just, I just keep going. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we look forward to having you on again soon because we didn't get to your primal chains, but we do definitely want to start covering that. But given the current Mm. situation we're in, uh, we felt the lymphatic system definitely needs to be talked about, uh, especially with what's going on today. People definitely need to have Mm -hmm. better immune systems. They need to understand this stuff. So thank you very much again, brother. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for tuning in. I had a blast. And until next time, everybody out there listening, be good to each other.